Hello everyone. In this video, we are going to talk about norms of vectors and matrices. So the norm that you probably have used or the magnitude that you have used for any vector so far is what we call the Euclidean norm or two norm, which is basically sum of the square entries under the square root, right? Or if you want to uh, deal with vector notation, you can say x transpose times x. If x is a column vector, x transpose is a row vector. The product is a scalar, which is uh, sum of the square entries. And the square root of that is going to be the Euclidean norm. This is the norm that so far probably you have learned in your courses and used. But there are other types of norms in the literature one of them is called uh, in uh, in general uh, we have something called the p norm so two norm is one of the p norms okay two norm is one of the p norms so p norm is the absolute value of any entry raised to the power p sum them all up and then take the p root of the result so, for example, the third norm is going to be what? It's going to be like x1 cubed, correct? Of course, absolute value of that cubed plus absolute value of x2 cubed and all the way down to the last entry of the vector, absolute value of that cubed. And then the third root of that, you might call it what? Norm of vector x number three right so that's in general called the p norm right and uh the no the although you can plug in any number for p really but there are some of them that are used a lot more in the literature than the others the second norm is of course the most used one but there are other ones one of them is one norm so one norm simply means add the absolute value of all entries together it is also called the Manhattan norm or the cap taxicab norm, okay? So if you have a vector, let's say x is equal to um, 2, negative 3, and 1, right? Then the one norm of this x, and by the way, norm is shown inside 2, uh, absolute value signs uh, the one norm for this is going to be some of the absolute values of the entries correct so it is going to be six right while the second norm that we learn in the literature it is going to be the square root of some of these numbers squared which is going to be square root 14. So clearly for a different P, you get a different number, right? And each one of them has its own application. This Manhattan norm or taxicab norm, this is one of the things you use in uh, grid problems, in machine learning and so on. When you are having a problem over a grid and uh, you want to go from one point to another or something and all you can do is to move horizontally or vertically this Manhattan norm or uh, taxicab norm or one norm is something that you can use instead of the Euclidean norm okay to find let's say the distance from your point to the goal point you can use the Euclidean norm you can use the Manhattan norm and so on and so forth you can watch one of my videos under robotics on path planning and uh, in the A star algorithm, when I explained it, I mentioned that the Manhattan norm is something you can use for uh, your uh, heuristic cost function, G. So you can uh, refer to that. And there is an infinity norm. The infinity norm is simply maximum of the absolute values. Which entry, the max, the absolute value of it is the max, use that as the infinite norm. So for example, for here, the infinite norm is going to be what? It's going to be which one of these has the maximum absolute value, and that is the absolute value of negative 3, which is going to be 3. Okay, so the P norm in general can be defined for any P, but the one useful are, or most used are 
1 to and infinity norm, okay? So these are the vector norms. And in MATLAB, you can use the command norm of A and P, and that gives you the norm of the vector. So if you say norm and you define a vector, let's say here, I define vector X to be, let's say, 4, 5, and 3. And let's add one more number also to make it longer. So, and let's say negative 7, right? So if I say norm of X and don't provide any number, it uses the 2 norm, the Euclidean norm. But if I say norm of x and 1, now it sums all the absolute values. So 4 plus 5, 9, and that is 10, it's going to be 19. Or if I say norm of infinity, i and f, that's the maximum absolute value, which is 7. Okay, so if you say norm or norm and 2, that's the same thing, because 2 is the default. So this is the norm of a vector. Now, you might say, and by the way, you know, the norm of a vector is an indication of magnitude of the vector. Now the question is, what about a matrix? So for matrices here, I uh, introduce you to two types of uh, norms. One category is called norms induced by vector norms. So they are defined in a similar way that this P norm is defined. And what it is, is uh, you choose a vector X, multiply matrix A by that vector X and calculate the P norm of the resulting vector. And then divide it by the P norm of the original vector X. And then keep changing this X as much as you can and calculate this ratio for any arbitrary vector X. The maximum ratio that you get for all different vectors of x, that maximum or supremum that you will get, you call it the p norm of uh, matrix A. Okay, but you know you cannot do that. You cannot try infinitely many vector x's and see which one is the max. And it doesn't matter. You try a million, you can never guarantee that's the norm because uh, you might try a new one and that is bigger than what you have so far. So there should be some other way to calculate this uh, P norm or induced P norm for the matrix. And uh, you can show for specific values of P, you can find an equivalent formula for that induced P norm for the matrix. For example, if it's one norm, instead of this, what you can show is it's the maximum absolute column sum of the matrix. If it's the P norm, it's the infinity norm, it's the maximum absolute row sum of the matrix. If it's two, then it is the maximum eigenvalue of the gram matrix A transpose A under the square root. So there is proof behind each and every one of these. And it doesn't mean if you choose any arbitrary P, there is always a nice formula for it like this. So there is a lot of proof behind each and every one of these. But uh, how do we calculate them? What's the meaning of them? Okay. So uh, when I say the one norm for a matrix, maximum absolute column sum, what do I mean? I mean like if your A is something like 4, negative 1, 0, 3, 6, 2, 8, negative 7, 9, 4, 5, and negative let's say, uh, three. So when I say absolute column sum, it means go ahead and sum absolute values of entries in each column. So here, if you add absolute values, you get five, right? Here, you will get uh, 18. Here, you will get 19. And here, you will get 10. Which one is the maximum sum of entries in a column? That's this guy. So the norm one of matrix A is 19. On the other hand, the infinity norm for it is add the rows absolute values together. So here, if you add this row, you will get 15. If you add this row, you will get 23. And if you add this row, you will get 14. 
and clearly the maximum row column row uh, sum absolute value is 23 okay so that's how you calculate the norm 1 and norm infinity for a matrix now for uh, Norm 2, you have to multiply A transpose by A. Here, your A is 3 by 4. Your A transpose is 4 by 3. So when you multiply, the result is a 4 by 4. So in general, it has four uh, lambdas, four eigenvalues. One of them is the max. You choose that and take the square root of it. So for that, I will use MATLAB and define A. So it's 4, 3, 6, 2. Right? Let's do that. So A is 4... 3, 6, and 2. Then you have negative 1895. And finally, you have uh, 0, 074, 3. 0, 74, 3. So that's your A. Now I form the gram matrix by multiplying a transpose by A. It's a 4 by 4 matrix. I get the eigenvalues of it. You see it has four eigenvalues. This is the max. And so the square root of that is going to be our 2 norm. So 2 norm here is 1497. Right? So, of course, they give you different numbers. And um, you see how I calculated each and every one of them. In MATLAB, you can do the same thing. But before I show you the MATLAB command for each one of these, there is another way that you can introduce a norm for a matrix, and that's called the Frobenius norm, or a norm F. And norm F is simply square each and every one of the entries and add all of them together. Okay, along all rows and all columns. Or another way you can do it is if you have this gram matrix that we used last time, you can use the trace of that and take the square root of it. That's the same thing. So in this case, let me show you. Uh, G is that gram matrix. And if I say what is the square root of trace of this G, this is the Frobenius norm, 1761 up to two decimals, correct? So, or as I said, you can go ahead and sum all of the entries in A, uh, square them, sorry, and then add them together, right? So how can I do that? Well, first I square A, right? Each and every entry in it. So I use dot power two. Now they're all squared. And now I need to add all of this together. Now, um, for that, I use sum of A and then I vectorize A. So I convert A into a line vector, 16 by 1. Take sum of it. That is this guy. Uh, well, not that actually. Uh, I should have called it something else. So here I should say answer. That's 310, and then the square root of that 310 is what? That's 1761 that we had. Okay, so in uh, if you use either formula, you will get the Frobenius norm, and clearly, again, all of them are giving you something different, and each one might have its own application. In MATLAB, again, you can use the command norm if you want. So if I say, what is norm of A and 1? You see it's 19, which is the same thing we found here, right? If I say norm infinity, that should be the 23 that we had. And then the 2 norm and the Frobenius norm. So if I say 2 norm, that is that 1497, the square root of lambda max. And for norm Frobenius, as here, you can see, use inside quotation mark FRO. 
So you have to say what is norm of F with Frobenius. And that gives you 17.60. Okay? So these are um, different ways to calculate the norm of a matrix. And after we know how to calculate the norm of a matrix, you might come down to the million dollar question again. What's the use? For norm of a vector, I understand that's an indication of the magnitude of the vector or the distance between the endpoint of the vector and the origin, right? Fine. What about the matrix? What am I introducing by norm of a matrix? Well, you are when the norm of the matrix is very small, let's say, for example, this Frobenius norm, which is quite easy to understand. When it is very, very small, what does it mean? It means each and every one of the entries in it should be very small. Otherwise, some of the square elements all over the matrix is not going to be very small. So when you say this norm of A is a very, very small number, it means the absolute value of each and every one of the entries should be very, very small so if you want to make sure let's say in a numerical algorithm each and every one of the entries in your matrix has converged to a very very small number let's say for example the goal is to converge to zero you want to make sure each and every one of entries have converged instead of going in a for loop and checking each and every one of uh, aijs for any i and any j Instead, you can look at the cumulative effect in the Frobenius norm. So you say, if the Frobenius norm is very small, then I can say every entry in my matrix is almost zero, right? So it's just to look at one single number instead of all the entries of a matrix to see whether the matrix has uh, big entries or it has small entries, okay? So it gives you an indication of the size of entries in a matrix in general, okay? The cumulative effect of that. So hopefully this video was useful to you, the normal vectors and matrices, and I will see you in my next lecture. Thank you.